So there's this wonderful thing where we assume that hiding our weaknesses is, is a beneficial thing to do. But actually, the psychology says that if we want to appear more competent, if we want to appear more likable, if we want to appear more persuasive, revealing a weakness can be very powerful. What's the secret to becoming more likable and influential as a leader? How do we actually build and scale by appealing to our consumers in a sustainable way? Why are we more likely to eat that imperfect cookie? This week's episode will have you taking copious notes from Phil Agnew, a behavioral science expert and my podcast brother in the network, where he hosts one of the top marketing podcasts, Nudge, and shares tips of the trade you can start applying to, yes, win business and influence people today. You don't want to miss it. All right, so this is action for the editors. All right, we are recording with Phil. I am so excited, Phil, to have you on. How are you? And tell me more about uh, what you've been up to. Yeah, I'm very good, Sarah. Thank you. Um, what have I been up to? I have been working on my podcast a fair bit. Um, so you and I are both part of the same podcast network, HubSpot Podcast Network. I run a show called Nudge. And on that show, I spend a lot of time interviewing people far, far smarter than me about behavioral science. So I've been spending a lot of time on that. And then my day job is working as a senior product marketer at a company called Buffer that helps with social media scheduling. So we definitely have a marketing expert and consumer behavior analyst on the show here, which we don't um, have often. I've been following the show and tuning into a lot of your breakdowns and absolutely love so much of that, which I think can be brought to the world of business and venture capital, which is what we're all about here in Billion Dollar Moves. So I want to start, you know, in true Billion Dollar Moves fashion, Phil, in understanding what really brought you to this work. I mean, mm. what was the fascination, that starting point for you in consumer behavior? Yeah, well, I mean, it goes back to what I studied at university. I studied marketing at university, which is a bit of a rogue thing for a marketer to do. Most come into marketing. They don't bother spending a lot of money to study it. But then I went into my first job and I found myself to be honestly largely useless at what I was doing. I was struggling to create copy that persuaded people. I was struggling to create subject lines that people open the emails to. I was struggling to do a lot of the tactical things that you need to do as a marketer to get results. And fortunately, fairly early on into my career, I stumbled upon the world of behavioral science, which is basically evidence-backed decision-making. Um, so this is the, the world of psychology. We've spent hundreds of years trying to understand how people make decisions. And behavioral scientists have, have been unpacking this and sharing how people make decisions and the common biases that they have. And there's a whole world of consumer psychology upon which you can apply this stuff to marketing. And I found when I started to apply this stuff that my marketing was, was far more successful. So I, I became just like hooked on, on behavioral science. And I think today, and hopefully this is what we can talk about a lot of, is I think it's, it's interesting far beyond just the realm of marketing it's interesting in understanding the the biases we all have why we make certain decisions why we're flawed with certain decision making tactics and this is useful to anyone i believe in business absolutely and and i want to dig real deep here uh when you started sort of looking at the different authors and going deep into this what surprised you i mean was there a sort of a, a particular theory that comes to mind in what you didn't expect yeah, I think one definitely stands out. So I always assumed that sharing a weakness um, was, a, was a bad thing to do. Revealing one of your flaws would make people doubt you, reduce their perception of your competence, you know, just didn't seem like a good thing to do. And then I read about these wonderful studies by a researcher called Elliot Aronson. And what he did in his, his research is he, he filmed an actor answering quiz questions correctly and then he showed that video to a set of participants the participants didn't know it was an actor they thought it was somebody who was just very intelligent answering lots of quiz questions correctly and he filmed two versions of the video one version the actor gets all these questions right walks off stage that's it end of video same and then the second video the actor gets all the same questions right and then goes to walk off stage but spills his coffee down himself so spills coffee so he basically reveals a weakness, the weakness being that he's a bit clumsy, and, you know, a bit unsure footed. And when Elliot Aronson showed these two videos to sets of participants, so A-B test where 
different people see different videos and then ask them how competent do you rate this individual how likable do you rate this individual he found that people rated the individual as far more likable and even more competent as well even though they were re revealing a flaw and this study has been replicated in in far more applicable areas like job interviews so another area where i would have thought i should not show a weakness is a job interview yet joe sylvester in her study i think in swansea university in wales um, she got dozens of different research assistants to apply for jobs but all share that they basically had a similar level of skills and um experience and so they would apply for these jobs sending very very similar cvs usually under the same name but some of the cvs would reveal a flaw a weakness and others would just solely talk about the the strengths that the individual has and she found that the individuals who showed that weakness that flaw were far more likely to get an interview far more likely to progress to further rounds far more likely to you know to continue and, and actually get the job and so there's this wonderful thing where we assume that hiding our weaknesses is, is a beneficial thing to do. But actually, the psychology says that if we want to appear more competent, if we want to appear more likable, if we want to appear more persuasive, revealing a weakness can be very powerful. So so that's one that, that I wish I'd known a, a bit earlier in my career. Yeah, and being uh, really raw about who you are, does it create sort of trust? Is that the psychology in um, you really being relatable, likable? Is that why as well? I mean, I'm, and I'm jumping ahead here, but one of the, the concepts that you brought about was uh, about the human characteristics that we put on brands as well to be more relatable. Hmm. Is, is yeah. that, does it come from trust? I was thinking a lot about that. Yeah. So this effect is known as the, the Prattful effect. And yeah, it's, it's this idea that if you show a weakness, you you boost lots of attributes about yourself. And it's, as, as you sort of alluded to, it's not just visible with people, it's visible with products as well. So um, cookies that have imperfect edges, they appear, they, they are liked more when shown to, to potential cookie eaters. This was a study done by Adam Ferrier in Australia. Um, they're preferred by 66% to 44%. So cookies wow. that look imperfect as well appear more likable. And I think if you if you think about that diligently you realize yeah this is down to trust so when see when people see a cookie that doesn't look flawless you think oh this must be homemade i trust that this was created by hand i trust that this is this is a genuine product created by someone gen you know locally rather than something that's mass produced and yeah the same as can be applied to humans and of course the same can be applied to major brands as well some of the most successful marketing is marketing that actually reveals a flaw in the uk there's a, a yeast extract spread called marmite and it's not famous for being a yeast extract spread that's not particularly interesting but marmite's tagline for the past 50 years has been you'll either love it or you'll hate it so they hmm. they prominently play on this idea that mo people really won't ha like this product they will hate it and by highlighting that they make people trust their brand more trust their marketing more and are more likely to buy same can be said for the the very famous many of your listeners will know this one the avis campaign where avis we, we're second so we try harder now all that does is add an element of trust which makes people more likely to, to pick them um, these are all real world experiments but there's one in in a in a study which has been peer-reviewed which is a, a fantastic one which is where a waiter who is reading out the menu actively discourages uh, one of the diners or some of the diners from eating one of the dishes so if a, if a waiter says i really by the way i really wouldn't get the lobster today it's not fresh what you find is in the scenarios where the waiter reveals a weakness in the menu the waiter ends up getting a far far larger tip so the individual tend to do, tend to do very well. Um, so waiters listening, if get the approval from your manager, but go and say that something on the menu is not very nice. Um, and, and, and actually, the individuals who are dining tend to spend more as well. So they increase the amount that they, they, they buy simply because they trust the restaurant far more. Think about it logically. If a restaurant's willing to tell you that one of their dishes isn't fresh, you're far more likely to think that the rest of their dishes must be incredibly good if they're willing to tell you something like that. So I think it is around this element of trust, boosting this element of trust, boosting this element of likability. And it, honestly, it's just a smart tactic that all of us can endorse. You know, revealing a, a flaw is a smart thing to do. 
Hey folks, by now you know that Billion Dollar Moves is proud to be part of the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals, together with other amazing podcasts like Creator Science, hosted by my friend Jay Klaus, where he goes behind the scenes to explore how creators like James Clear to Cody Sanchez are making a living with their art and creativity and how you can do the same. And a favorite episode is, of course, with my podcast crush, Guy Raz, the host of How I Built This on what he's learned from great creators, the similarities he observes between high-performing artists and entrepreneurs, the role work plays in success, and the trade-offs that come with having high ambition. Listen to Creator Science wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, and and I love this, and I want to take this two ways, right? So what you're pointing to, one is, I guess, the from a human element as a leader, as an individual, how you can apply that uh, in your leadership to be more likable and relatable. And on the other as well, in terms of building your brand a little bit more intentionally. So let's start with part one. One of the things that I, I struggle with, I, I mean, you know the work that I do, I look at, uh, you know, how do we address the gender venture funding gap and what the key uh, issues that we see and, and an example I like to use, which is still the case, is women applying for a job will only raise their hand if they feel like they were 110 percent qualified, right, that they meet all the requirements. Whereas men uh, more likely will say in their studies that show this, you know, if you meet 65 percent, yeah, I'm the man, I've got this, I'll learn on the job. How do you think we can shift this thinking uh, where, you know, the woman still feels that she has to hide all her flaws, be as perfect as possible. And yet for men, it's it's the opposite. Does this still apply, you know, taking into account gender stereotypes that exist? Oh, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, if you read about behavioral science, you will completely understand that gender stereotypes, gender bias is a, an incredibly large problem within hiring today. Um, endless studies showcase how when you attempt to hide gender during the interview process, you end up getting far better candidates and a far better balance of diversity as well. And every study will tell you that a diverse team is a high performing team is a much more high performing team. You know, there's the infamous study, the famous study with orchestras, where when orchestras made their interview process blind, the number of females in the orchestra increased dramatically. So all they were doing was was asking the violinist to perform behind a curtain rather than perform out in the open. And when you just listen to the sound of the violinist, you can rank them without being biased by their, their race, their gender, or whatever else. And that's a fantastic example of how blind um, interviews are, are a really powerful way to, to, to beat these biases. But it's not the only way. There's evidence, there's some studies that suggest that the type of language we use in our job descriptions can change how likely people are to, to go for the job. So language, which is, you know, based around power and control and dominating language appeals more to individuals who who feel connected to those types of adjectives. So unfortunately, that tends to be men. So if you contain language within your job description about um, being a powerful manager or a manager that can truly uh, lead a team and delegate and using these terms that appeal to men, you, you end up getting men far more likely to apply. Whereas if you use terms that are uh, more gender neutral or perhaps even terms that appeal more to, to women and again huge huge um yeah. like stereotypes in both of these i was going to offer um a study that i looked at recently was the use of the word ninja so of course you know mm. in the world of tech silicon valley right we are all about hustle culture which needs to change and yeah. you know there was a couple of job descriptions using the word ninja but women do not associate with themselves being ninjas so once they remove that uh terminology it actually changed the results so exactly what you were saying here. I had actually um, Michelle Walker who coined the, the term the grey rhino. So she's a risk expert thinking about risk, right? And one of the things that we talked about was stereotype threat and that uh, a lot of language that you point to uh, pushes women to be branded as, you know, risk averse when really studies show that there is no real uh, difference between women and men. And the reality is that we're not comparing apples to apples. I mean, can a woman, I guess, uh, taking into account what you said, still be seen to be competent uh, while revealing her flaws? I mean, there's always a fear here that, you know, she has to be perfect. Do you think that plays out in any way? Yeah, I mean, so you're asking, would the practical effect be as effective for women as it is for men? I think that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm pretty sure the studies that Joe Sylvester ran, she's a, a female um, researcher, I believe, from Swansea University, did include women. So pretty sure that peer-reviewed study 
would would hold up evidence um i think the fact is though you've got to take into account that these biases do exist anyway and the the level upon which the the effect will have for a woman versus a man is is probably different i'll reveal my own weakness here sarah and be very transparent about the fact that i haven't done enough research into gender imbalance i haven't done enough research into hiring processes and i haven't done enough research into you know being a female leader and i can't speak from experience so i probably don't have as much as i would love to say on the topic but i think the the evidence definitely suggests that these effects are, are powerful for both men and women they have an effect across genders across society across um uh, sort of race as well but you've also got to take into account that the effect is not always the same amount while it might boost mm. one person by 2x it might only boost another's likelihood of getting an interview by 1.5x for example so i think understanding all of that within context is important I love that to be the next episode on Nudge and I'll be happy to help you out there. I've got a, a ton of research to dig into. Now let's go to part two, which is really making brands relatable, right? I think uh, one of the things that I was really fascinated in, in what you uncovered was uh, how many brands actually put human-like figures that you can associate. Talk to us a little bit about that effect and how leaders should be thinking about building their brands here. Yeah, so this is something that I think all of us notice, but we don't think anything about. We don't think about why Tony the Tiger is a has a you know has a human face to put on the Frosties logo. Why there's you know um, Pringles has a face on it. Foot Locker has a face on it. Green Giant has a face on it. McDonald's has a face. You know all these all these characters associated with brands. It's something that is commonplace from Colonel Sanders to Johnny Walker. You know we're used to it, but we don't really think about it. And I didn't think about it myself until I interviewed a brilliant researcher called Aaron Ahuvia on Nudge, and he talked to me about anthropomorphic thinking and anthropomorphic thinking is this idea that we have positive associations towards other humans and positive associations towards faces and when something appears to look like a face we we, we change our how much we might like that thing so there's this brilliant study with christopher bartneck in the, the university of canterbury and in his study he had a a cat an, a sort of cat robot sitting next to the participant's computer and the cat robot could could sort of talk to the participant so <laughs> you can look up a youtube video of this study it sort of it doesn't really talk it sort of you know pleads in a in a robotic style really doesn't seem very human but it has a has a face has like a, a smiley face with eyes and even though it's a robot it has this face and he asks the participants to do a few simple tasks with the cat the the goal of the task is to be as quick as possible so the participants are getting paid based on how quick they are and then at the at the end and this is still timed he says you know can you please unplug the cat as, as quickly as possible and what happens when he says this is he plays a he, he plays a recording on the cat and the cat starts to plead for its life it starts to say please don't turn me off please keep me on please i'll just be quiet I'll, honestly like i'll just be quiet you you can tell the researcher you told me off i'll just be quiet and you know this is a simple task it's the equivalent of unplugging your toaster you and i could do that in a second and yeah what christopher bartnick found was that participants were either very very slow to unplug the robot or they didn't at all they lied and kept the robot plugged in and it's you know this is this idea that when objects like a brand like a product have these human connotations have a human face or, or perhaps talk like a human we treat them differently and you can link this to many many things so slot machines for example this is studies in casinos slot machines that look like they have a human face so perhaps just the way it's designed it looks like there are two eyes in the top right hand corner it looks like there's a nose perhaps in the middle and then a, a big smiley face where the money comes out individuals who rank highly on on their feeling of dominance and their feeling that they can manipulate other people will end up playing those slot machines far more than any other slot machines simply because they they look at them and they think oh that's a human face and i can manipulate people so i can manipulate this slot machine um, wow. other studies with cookies find that if you put a smiley face on a cookie people are far more likely to eat that cookie. And in fact, after they, they, they're asked, why did you eat that cookie? Some even identify it and they say, oh, you know, I had a smiley face. It was almost like it was asking me to, to eat it. So there's all these evidence that basically if something has a human face or if something appears to, to have human quantities, we or human qualities, sorry, I should say, we view it differently. 
we end up liking it yeah. more we end up potentially doing the thing it asks and if it asks us not to turn it off we might do that and if it asks us like pringles does to once to te- or tells us once we pop we can't stop we're, we're far more likely to do that as well so that's the reason why so many brands have human-like characteristics and human-like mm. mascots so tactically speaking, I guess, in, in implementing in, in the app businesses uh, for, for the leaders tuning in, it would be in thinking about ways you can humanize uh, the brands that you create and, and mm-hmm. really almost like mascots, right? It's having an mm-hmm. iconic character that you can recognize. Um, but beyond, I guess, iconic characters, what comes to mind is also taglines, right? I think mm-hmm. a, a couple that come to mind because you're worth it, just do it, right? How, how do you think about building taglines that are sticky yeah well firstly around anthropomorphic thinking there's this great study around um the language you use in your taglines and around human language versus technical language and i'm going to forget the words but it was a study that was done with iphones and they showed two different types of iphone ads to people and some of the ads used purely technical language and some of the other ads or the all the a b uh, a b test the b ads used more humanized language rather than saying the iphone has an incredible processor it'll say the iphone's got great intelligence or it's just had an iq boost or you know it can see further if the camera's got better so he's talking about it inside of human terms and it turned out that mm-hmm. that language humanizing that language made that copy far more effective Upon the same lines, there's a lot of study around concrete fa- phrases. So this is a brilliant work by Christopher Begg. And he gave participants lists of phrases to try and remember. This is extremely important for folks trying to come up with a tagline. And these phrases were, were either phrases you could visualize, like square door or um, brown horse. And then some phrases were phrases that you weren't able to, to visualize. So a phrase like unique idea or... Um, ambiguous quantity and he asked them to remember these phrases came back to them later in the day and asked how many do you remember and i think it was something to the effect of four times that people were four times more likely to remember the concrete phrases to remember phrases you can visualize and this is especially important when it comes to tagline the best example of this is mp3 players in the early 2000s so mp3 players were dominated by um Samsung and uh, Philips and Sony and they all in their advertisements talked about the technical elements that they had in their mp3 player you know they would say we've got 250 megabytes worth of storage and um, we've got brilliant hertz quality uh, playback so you can listen to all your songs at such high quality and then iPhone came into the market and they didn't talk about any of that they just used a simple concrete phrase and they said 1,000 songs in your pocket. And that's, simpler, that's a very simple application of Christopher Beck's theory, that if you use concrete language, you're far more likely to be remembered, far more likely to be recalled. And it's no surprise when you compare those ads side by side that Apple did so well. You know, If you say 250 megabytes, who's going to remember that? If you say 1,000 songs, well, I can visualize 1,000 songs and I'm far more likely to buy an iPod when I see that ad. Yeah, and, and, and this brings to the thinking of almost, I guess, keeping it as, as simple as possible and thinking from the perspective of a consumer, right? With, uh, mm-hmm. you know, not necessarily sharing the product specs that don't matter or, or that they can't visualize to be impacting their lives versus a thousand songs in their pocket. I, I mean, this is a very important concept because a lot of the challenges actually we see with startups is, you know, the, a lot of them are product builders, so they're obsessed about their products, the technical, uh, you know, capabilities and the upgrades and how it has been improved from one version to the other. But it's almost like uh, they built first before actually uh, building into product market fit, which is a common uh, reason that a lot of products fail. How have you seen, um, you know, brands or companies do this in a way that, really thinks from the consumer first and implement it so that they're able to scale well. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is my job as a as a product mar- marketer. We're doing this at Buffer right now. We're trying to think about, okay, what's the value that Buffer, a social media scheduling company, provides? Is it that it can schedule your social media posts exactly when you want? Is it that it has great API links with Twitter and Meta and Instagram and LinkedIn? No, what it really is, is a tool to help you grow your following because that's the outcome that people want people don't want to be able to you know have 
scheduled posts that go out on time. Well, maybe they partially do, but the real thing they want, the real reason why they're doing that is to grow their following, create click-worthy content and save more time as well. So we've completely shifted our marketing to highlight those three jobs to be done. And that's mm. completely in line with this concrete. The company I love most, uh, a startup company, well, it's no longer a startup, it's doing very well, but but they understood this from day one. And it was a brilliant company. It's a company called Loom. And Loom let you record videos of yourself, send them very quickly via a, a browser-based or a URL-based um a unique URL you can send you can record a video of you and your screen send it via URL to someone very easy way to send a video message now sending a video message is hardly a new thing right this this product came about about three years ago four years ago sending a video message has been around for ages we can do it on our phones we can do it with all sorts of different tools we have we can do it in zoom we can do it in, in the tool we're using now you know it's very easy to send a video message and Loom have yet somehow managed to dominate the market. And I think a big part of that is because of the taglines and the marketing they used. When they went to market, they didn't say, oh, we allow you to record in um, 1080p HD or we'll give you 16 gigabytes of storage or we source everything in um, local clouds, which make it faster to, to showcase your videos. Because they know nobody cares about that. They know that's not what interests people. So instead, rather than thinking of all the technical achievements that they've done, they think, okay, what does the customer get from this? What the customer gets is no more meetings. <laughs> it's the ability to stop yeah. being in meetings and to and to simply share a message over a quick loom rather than having to do a 30-minute meeting. So all of Loom's initial advertising, and I, I believe they're still using this today in their positioning and messaging, is don't join meetings, just send a loom. You know, this can eradicate your calendar, it can completely drop down the amount of time you spend in meeting, and you can save far more time to get back to the work that you have to do. And so Loom, rather than be p being positioned against Skype and Zoom and you know, all these other video tools, is simply positioned as an alternative to a meeting. And that's, that's, that's a market where they're far more likely to win. The product that can kill meetings is a product that people will use. The product that has 10 gigabytes of storage is one that gets forgotten. Yeah, I love that. So I'm I'm taking copious notes here, you know, about thinking and outcomes, right? Uh, jobs to be done. I mean, that's that's a common word that we use, but really, what are the jobs that your consumers, your end users, your beneficiaries are looking to achieve, and how can you really uh, use that in your marketing as in the way that Loom has done? And interestingly, what Loom has also uh, evidenced is really being very specific and focused, right? Um, mm. I think these days, one of the challenges that a lot of um, uh, startups, technologies, products that are being built today is they can have so many different use cases, right? Uh, and it's a challenge to figure out, do I go horizontal? Do I go vertical? Uh, do I start with one or do I start broadly? What, what are your thoughts here? So I lean a lot on April Dunford's positioning work. So April Dunford, she is a um, brilliant positioning messaging expert. Uh, she's written a fantastic book called Obviously Awesome. And she helps marketers like me come up with positioning. And one of the rules that she has in her positioning framework is don't try and be everything for everyone. Because by going broad and going wide, you only end up not really appealing to any specific group. She says, find the thing that is uniquely beneficial to the to audience you want to go after and focus solely on that. And there are so many wonderful applications of this. There's a brilliant um, houseplant company here in the UK and they sell houseplants. And you might think that they would talk about all of the different plants they have on offer. You might think that they would talk about all of the, you know, deals and discounts that they have but they don't talk about that at all instead they say almost unkillable plants so they are solely trying to sell themselves <laughs> that's for me to people, I need that. <laughs> to people who have house plants that die yeah that's their that's who they sell themselves through and 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 that means that they are turning off a large swathe of buyers they, that means they're turning off people with green fingers people who who really love plants people who, who who spend a lot of time caring for them they are happily turning away that audience in order to win others standing for something is a fantastic way to actually benefit you know the, the only real brands that go really broad a giant fmcgs who really can appeal to a whole swathe of people and even them 
even they find value in getting specific. Take the Coke campaign where Coke put the names of individual people on their cans. That's a great example of Coke trying to go really narrow and change their messaging so they appeal to individual people. But yeah, focusing your message like the plants company did, saying we we create almost unkillable plants is far better than saying we create plants for every house, for example. Mm. Companies are under pressure right now. Pressure to get more leads, close deals faster, and get better insights to create the best experience for customers. A CRM can help, but not just any CRM. One that is easy to set up, intuitive to use, and customizable to the way that you do business. That's where HubSpot comes in. HubSpot CRM is easy for everyone to use on day one and helps teams be more productive. Drag and drop your way to attention-grabbing emails and landing pages. Set up marketing automation to give every contact white glove treatment. Plus, AI-powered tools like Content Assistant means less time spent on tedious manual tasks and more time for what matters, your customers. HubSpot CRM has all the tools you need to wow prospects, lock in deals, and improve customer service response times. Get started for free today at HubSpot.com slash billion dollar moves. You did, I guess... Uh cover a little bit about using marketing and messaging language. Uh, and it's undeniable that culture is part of that, right? You even talked about how, uh, in many ways, the marketing campaigns built culture or were part and parcel of that culture. And I guess the question that I have a lot of times for marketers is, where does the responsibility lie here? You know, how do you think about the fact that you're using all these tools in the toolkit, right, to influence mm. consumers, to influence a culture? It's a really good question. Are we comfortable with brands persuading us to do things? Because that's the world we live in at the moment. That's 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 the world we live in. That's that's what we have grown to accept. We expect advertising you know we all use instagram and facebook and twitter with the expectation twitter less so these days but with the expectation that it is free in order to to watch ads and because we watch ads we know that there's a chance we'll be influenced by these things now i don't think that's a bad thing i think you know that's a fundamental part to make capitalism work it allows new companies to to come about and the ability to advertise allows people to reach new audiences and so on and so forth and and, and like you say ads become a huge part of our culture you know it's easy for people to recall lots of infamous ads and lots of brand figures i would argue to a point that more people would recognize colonel sanders if if you put a couple of pictures up then perhaps their local mp in the uk or their local congressman in the states so we are heavily influenced by ads as well that said and, and i think and this is something important for marketers to bear in mind is is to use that influence you know wisely you know you should be using that influence with the expectation that you shouldn't be doing things unethical de beers created this necessity to buy a diamond engagement ring when people right. propose that's all through their advertising um, and ads ultimately have dictated who we pick in elections you know, there are infamous ads from Lyndon Johnson's Daisy ad where a young girl counts down from 10 and the nuclear bomb goes off and that encouraged people to vote for Lyndon Johnson in a time of, of real fear around nukes. And the same could be said for Kennedy. His famous picture of Nixon saying, would you buy a used car from this man inspired millions of people to vote for Kennedy. So look, ads can be very influential. They can, can be very powerful. They should be used wisely because ultimately they can form aspects of our culture and our society. Yeah, and that brings me very nicely actually to what is uh, definitely in the minds of our culture today, uh, and that is AI, right, in marketing. Are you worried about uh, AI taking over your job, Phil? Oh, yeah, big time. <laughs> I'm very worried, yeah. Where do you think uh, AI is really going to change things in the future for brands and marketing and things like that? Yeah, I think, well, um, I think AI ultimately will make a lot of marketing tasks redundant, unfortunately. I think, you know, it will remove a lot of the the weight from the role. And hopefully that'll mean it'll free marketers up to do other things. Hopefully that'll mean that marketers can become far more specialist. They can become far more knowledgeable. You know, perhaps marketers on your team will be experts in pricing psychology and experts in buyer psychology or experts in persuasion tactics and then you can use the the ai to go and create a huge email campaign or write a bunch of copy for you based on those inputs but yeah i can imagine ai becoming far more influential than it than it currently is a big thing i worry about with ai is how much marketers will 
lean on it. So there is endless evidence from the world of behavioral science that we prefer the easy option. We take the easy option, whether that is fast food or Amazon one-click delivery or instant loans with, with high interest rates. We often go for the easy option and making something easy is a really easy, is a really fast way to change people's decisions. And the fear with AI is that it will be very easy for marketers to use. And I think it's already seeing it within marketing teams at the moment and within businesses at the moment. There's this ease of use with AI. It's, AI. it's very easy for it to just write a really quick blog post. The fear I have is that that might ultimately decrease the effectiveness of all of our work because we'll opt for that easy choice when the longer, harder choice might take a bit longer. Um, the one other thing I think about a lot with AI is, you know, how much people will value content when they know it's written by AI. There's a lot of psychology behind wanting to understand the effort and labor that's gone into something. And if we know something has been written in seconds by, by AI, we will value it far, far less. There's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that. So if marketing, yeah. if emails do end up getting written by AI and the consumer knows that, that's potentially going to be make that email, for example, and we can you can you can share that with lots of different other mediums, but that will make it far less effective. And that's a fear I think marketers should have. Mm. And, and I love actually that example of um, the psychology of labor and, and value. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I think this is really interesting for a lot of your listeners. So when you're making big decisions at companies and, and you're trying to influence people to do something, one of the easiest ways you can persuade people that the decision you're suggesting is a good decision is by showing the amount of labor you've put in to creating that decision. So these are studies, uh, lots of different studies have been run on that. One of the most famous is with real estate agents. In this study, they got real real estate agents um, to give a list of houses to prospect prospective buyers and say, you know, here are the houses I've come up with for you. How, how relevant are they for you? In some scenarios, the estate agent would say, oh, I spent all of last night working on this list. It took me nine hours. I really hope you like the list. I really hope you like the houses. In other scenarios, the real estate agent would say, oh, I used the computer to help out with this one. It only took me an hour. Really hope you like the houses. And it turns out when people hear the labor that's gone into the work, when they hear that somebody has spent all night working on that list, they value those same houses far higher. They're far more likely to go and visit them, far more likely to make an offer. And so showing the labor you put into something makes people value it more showing the labor you put into creating food makes people enjoy it more when you watch a chef this is studies that have been cited in hbr when you watch a chef create your meal you will rate that meal as being more enjoyable you'll rate it as being higher quality and you can apply this same thing to business. Steve Jobs was fantastic at this. Almost every keynote, he would start by saying, we've spent the last two years working on this product and I can't wait to show it to you today. He does that so, he does that repeatedly in a way which makes you realize that he, he understood the labor illusion. He understood that showing the effort that goes into something makes people value it more. And I think it's really important for leaders out there to remember because if you are trying to raise funding, for example, going out and talking about the lines of code, the huge number of lines of code that your folks have written, the huge number of product releases that you've worked on, the number of users that you've got and how how many people you've you've helped um, influence and helped helped out with your product. Love that. And I guess we've we've covered quite a lot of ground here from, you know, uh, labor and value to the misconceptions in marketing, building trust. What would be, as we wrap here, what would be your one, um, if there's nothing else but this one thing, a key takeaway that you want leaders tuning in to implement in their businesses, in their leadership, what would that be? Yeah, I'll take it right back to the start. I think highlighting your weaknesses is a, is a powerful thing and showcasing your flaws is a really useful thing for, for leaders to remember. I think some of the greatest leaders of our time have been able to admit when they're wrong. And that's valuable, not just because it helps them make better decisions, but because it really does make people warm to them. It really does make people appreciate them. And the same can be true for brands as well. I think when brands realize they've made a mistake and highlighting that and, and, and showcasing and perhaps apologizing, that can be beneficial too. Hiding your weaknesses, showing purely strength is not always the best thing to do. And there are dozens of examples I can give to end on, but I think, yeah, that's the takeaway I'd want people to have. 
Yeah, love that. Well, Phil, really enjoyed this uh, wide-ranging conversation. A lot more rabbit holes that I would love to go, go deep on. But of course, we can tune into all of that on your podcast. Tell us where we can find it and, and a little bit more of a, a pitch about uh, your work. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, just search for Nudge wherever you get your podcasts. You'll see a, a nice orange logo. That's my logo. And, and tune into Nudge. Um, yeah, lots of episodes on there you might like. One that new listeners tend to really enjoy is a deep dive I did on Steve Jobs. I mentioned him there. I think your listeners would really love that one. Great. Awesome, Phil. Well, thank you so much for your time, for your insights, and for making Billion Dollar Moves. And thanks so much for tuning in this week. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow our socials on Sarah Chen Global to get the latest on the show. It would really help me out too if you enjoyed this to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and share your favorite episodes with friends. I'm Sarah Chen Spellings and you've been listening to Bill and Dollar Moves.